Mount Carmel's Sunday morning service coming live from our Facebook page. We are located at 90 Port Perry Road, North for Sales, PA, 15137, where Reverend Barbara A. Gunn is our pastor. For those not on Facebook, please share with them our conference line so they may join in. The number is 516-387-8832. Again, that's 516 516- 387-8832. On behalf of our pastor and church, we express our appreciation to you for the many generous gifts to keep this ministry serving. If you would like to be a blessing to us, you may do so by going to our website at mountcarmelbaptistnv.org slash giving. That's mtcarmelbaptistnv.org slash giving. Mount Carmel, please be prepared to celebrate the Lord's Supper following this morning's message. COVID-19 testing will be held on Wednesday, February 10th from 2 to 4.30 p.m. Please register on the link on the website. Next Sunday is Operation Andrew Sunday, and the men will conduct the worship. The morning will begin with trustee David Odom's anointed theological enrichment at 10 a.m. And now there will be a selection, scripture and prayer, and another selection from Psalmist Bill Hawkins III before the message from Pastor Gunn. Please note, we do not own the rights to this music. And again, thank you for worshiping with us and may God bless you. Also, now, in recognition of Black History Month, notes from a future playwright will be presented by Faye Coleman. It's a 50-year-old love story between a Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright and the waitress who served him breakfast every day. Yeah, now that true story is coming to life through a series of letters no one knew existed. No one except a South Jersey woman who says the letters prove that her mom had a love affair with a legend. Pat, my heart, butterfly, in all is though, afraid and quivering. These are the words of a poet, a young man, 22 years old. Pat, my heart, she is fragile and toyless, timid and delicate. That young man was Pulitzer Prize winning playwright August Wilson, and Pat was Faye Coleman's mother, who was working as a waitress in a Pittsburgh restaurant in the 1960s. August Wilson would come in every morning, and uh, he would sit down in a corner booth and write. At that time, yeah, he was a struggling writer, so she'd say, shut up and eat, Augie, and he would be like, you know, I care about you, what are you doing, you know, just trying to engage her, get her to laugh, and um, yeah, that was how they got started. Faye found out about the relationship decades later when her mom revealed she'd held on to something special. She said, um, hold on a second. She said, I think I have some letters. Love letters. He dated them. He dated this one. 
It was interesting. This was the only one he dated. She'd kept six of them. It's a really interesting letter. That's fascinating. He starts in print. He ends in cursive. cursive. Faye shared her mother's story this morning with KYW News Radio's Cherry Gregg. They developed a connection, and that connection stood the test of time. August Wilson is perhaps best known for Fences and the Piano Lesson, but his play Two Trains Running, it's about a restaurant in Pittsburgh, and on the cover, a waitress. She goes, that I was his literary muse for that play. Bay says her mother's relationship with August Wilson lasted several years until it ran its course. Here is the letter, uh, Death of Feeling, where he was talking about how they broke up. So it's actually a two-page letter. And you see she's, you know, she kissed it. Um, this one said, from August with love. In fact, that's how he signed all his letters, August with love. She had nothing but fond memories of being a Pittsburgh girl uh, in a relationship with August Wilson. Wilson died in 2005. Pat passed away four years later. But these letters of a young romance still remain. In case you're wondering, the letters are all authenticated. Faye Coleman is now incorporating them into a new book.
Good morning. I will be reading from Luke chapter 19, verses 37 through 40. That's Luke chapter 19, verses 37 through 40. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Amen. Good morning, church. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I ask you, Lord, to please bless the message today, Lord, and the messenger. Please let the covenants of your word take over our hearts and our minds today, Lord. We also ask you for a special blessing for our seniors to keep them, to keep them healthy, alive, Lord, and, and, and continue to serve with us today, Lord. And of course, Lord, we always bless our children of the church, Lord. Please watch over them and let them still interface with us, Lord, as we commune virtually, Lord. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. never enough and what do you say when your friends turn away and you're all Nothing left to do. You just stand and watch how the Lord will bring you through after you've done all you can. You just stand. Tell me how do you handle the guilt of your past? Tell me, how do you deal with your shame? And how can you smile while your heart has been broken and filled with pain, filled with pain? Tell me, what do you do when you've done all you can? And it seems like you can't make it through. Well, you just stand when there is nothing left to do. You just stand and watch how the Lord will see you through. Yes, after you've done all you can, you just stand and be sure. Be not entangled in that bondage again. You just stand and endure. Because God has a purpose. Yes, God has a plan. Tell me, what do you do when you've done all you can? And it seems like you can't make it through. Well, you just stand. You stand. 
you say, hey, hey, hey. don't you dare give up through your storm, stand through the rain, through all of your hurt, yes, through your pain, and don't you bow, and don't you think. After you've done all you can, after you've done all you can, you just stand. Oh, 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 And praise God. We thank God this morning for your worship with us and all the things that the Lord is doing, even in times like these. I want to say to you, Mount Carmel, who are listening and watching, and all of our visitors who are viewing from whatever venue you are viewing us from, we really appreciate you being with us today. A couple of things I do need to address before I go into the message. Uh, it is Black History Month. And I want you to know that on next Sunday, the second Sunday, in lieu of his typical theological enrichment hour teaching, our trustee David Olimus has a very special black history emphasis that's going to be done at the 10 o'clock hour. We need you to tune in next Sunday at 10 o'clock for that hour. The other thing is one of the things that we have neglected to do since we've been sort of not in the building is our first Sunday prayer for the birthday folk. So I'm going to say to all of you who were born in the month of February, why don't you just put it in your comment section if you're on Facebook and say today's my birthday or this week, this month is my birthday because this prayer right now is for you. Let us pray. Father, we come in the name of Jesus and we thank you for the blessed souls that you have given the dawn of a new year of life and we pray for them now that this will be an exceptional year for them, a year of good health and strength, a year of answered prayer, a year of prosperity, a year where they draw so close to you, Father God, that we can't tell them from you. Father God, bless them in their families and in their homes. Meet their needs in the blessed name of Jesus. And Lord, when the end of this year comes, let them look back over this year and say, my, did not the Lord do great and mighty things this year. Bless them now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. And now to our message. It was read for your hearing in the 19th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. These words, verses 37 through 40. But I'm not going to read all of them. I just want to look at um, 39 and 40 where it says, and some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto Jesus, Master, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. If these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And these are the words that will form the basis of my message to you today. I'm going to ask you to pray with me as we share from this subject, the sound of stones crying, the sound of stones crying. Luke has been referred to as the people's gospel writer because in this third gospel, the great truths of Jesus are communicated primarily through vivid stories about people. Luke, a physician and a skilled writer, 
is more interested in persons, especially those in trouble, than he was in ideas. And perhaps, I don't know, being a Gentile and not a Jew, maybe Luke was more sensitive to the human experience in stories. He's the one who really brought more into focus some of the up close and personal issues that Jesus dealt with with people. And it is in Luke's gospel that the comparison is made between the haves and the have nots, the rich and the poor, the powerful and the weak. Luke in chapter 15, for instance, raises the all important message about the prodigal son. And, and it's an, an analogy, a comparison concerning man's insensitivity to God. In the parable of the great supper in chapter 14, Jesus shows how worldly minded men who treat the word of God with contempt will be shut out of heaven. In this 19th chapter that we're dealing with today, it is Jesus' last week on earth, and the tax collector Zacchaeus has the distinct honor of being the last change of life character in Jesus' earthly ministry before his crucifixion. And so this is what is referred to in this 19th chapter as Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The setting of this is one of the events leading to the final showdown between God and the devil preceding the crucifixion of our Lord. Jesus, in our text, had entered Jerusalem from Jericho. By this time, he was already a very mysterious figure to most of the people and a perceived threat to the religious or government authority in Israel. He had, however, accomplished what he was sent to do, with the exception of that one last act to give up his life to a save a dying world. People were following him. Many got it. They understood that this man was sent from God, even if they couldn't understand yet that he actually was God in the flesh. It was that visible outpouring and show of respect and acknowledgement that so angered the Jews who would not accept him. He was the promised Messiah that they had been taught about from literal birth. It did not matter to them that one of their very own prophets, specifically Isaiah, point by point prophesied perfectly of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And the crucifixion would happen because he would come into his own and his own would receive him not. They wanted him dead and out of the way to make room for a Messiah that they could be comfortable with. People want that now. They want to not deal with Jesus as who he is. They want a Jesus who will accept them by any means necessary, a Jesus that makes it comfortable for them to live life without any accountability, a Jesus that makes, it feel, makes them feel as though anything goes, and because everybody else is doing it, it's all right. A Jesus that, because they don't see him showing forth his mighty hand of wrath or judgment, they feel as though it's okay to just keep going on. A lot of people today want this comfortable Jesus, but Jesus is not comfortable, I promise you that. And let me read a brief excerpt from the Jewish historian, Josephus, concerning Jesus that will prove his impact on the Jewish culture while he was on the earth. This is found in the works of Josephus, the Book of Antiquities, 18.13, page 585, and I quote, this is Josephus. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure, he drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. So there was an understanding among them, just not an acceptance. People can understand a lot of things, church. But if it does not set with their wants and their desires, they will not accept even what they understand. People can understand things, but they don't want to accept it because it's not sitting right with what they would like to happen. And now in our text, it's coming to a head. As Jesus openly rides into Jerusalem on the back of a new colt with a massive crowd of followers loudly chanting and waving large palm leaves, saying, Hosanna to our king, which means save us. 
our king. The high priest and others are disturbed by such a commotion. Two things are bothering them the most. The fact that this obscure little man has such presence, a presence that overshadows them as leaders in Israel. When I say this obscure little man, all you have to do is read Isaiah 53 and read Isaiah's prophetic description of the physical appearance of Jesus, that he was born and despised of men, rejected, as if he did not even belong. Historians show, and, and even if you go to Israel and you go into the place which is supposed to be the tomb where Jesus was laid, it's not the tomb of a six-foot-five man, a, a bread pit type person. It wasn't the look that these people were looking for in the form of a king. Their kings of Israel were large men, and they were very powerfully built, and they were good looking. The Bible describes David. The Bible describes Saul. But this man was average. I think God had, had something in mind when he made the physical appearance of Jesus look more like the average common person than some exceptional being that anybody had to strive to look like. And so the fact that the people are now accepting him, they are following him. He is openly defying the Pharisees and has referred to them as hypocrites and instructed the people to do not do as they say. He shows no fear, no respect for these who have burdened the souls of the masses for centuries. On this day, it's in the air, the spirit of celebration and hope for a better life, a better future. The palms are waving in the wind as the crowd follow this man, who they call king, but not riding in a king's carriage, not wearing a king's robe or crown. His clothes do not matter to them. The least of his appeal is his apparel. There is a energy, a soul power, a peace, a spirit of hopeful expectation that exudes from Jesus, and it touches them in the hurting places of their lives. He had come down from the Mount of Olives, and verse 37 of our text says that the whole multitude of the disciples now listen, a disciple you know is a follower. The whole multitude, many followers began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all of the mighty works that they had already seen. My Lord, what had they seen? They had to have actually really seen some things to carry on so. And so they did. They saw family members and neighbors healed at his touch and even at his word. They saw him call a dead man out of the grave. They saw him with great compassion raise a dead young man in the middle of a funeral procession for the sole purpose of going back and taking care of his widowed mother. They saw blind folk receive sight with the dirtiest of mixtures made with dirt and spit. They saw crooked limbs straightened. They saw tax collectors, the thieves of the land, give folk back what they had been stolen from them. They saw a Roman officer who was once assigned to occupy their land and keep them at bay bow to this man humbly and ask him to heal his child. Oh, they saw some things, I tell you. They saw a woman in their community, one whom they themselves had shunned and cast aside because of her issue of blood, made whole just by his love. He never touched her, <laughs> but she touched him, and he did not reject her touch. Of course, they were on a high praise, wouldn't you be? Imagine where you are right now. Imagine even in this pandemic. Imagine Jesus coming through, the spirit of Jesus coming through. And those that are laying on hospital beds and RCUs right now with ventilators on them, and the doctor's telling the family that it won't be long now. Those that are suffering from the symptoms of COVID, those that are even experiencing the residue of what they've already been through. Imagine right now the spirit of Jesus flowing through the land and these people raising up, made whole, and there's never going to be any more attachment to this virus to them again. Would not you go somewhere and shout and praise? Oh, I believe God's going to do it. I'm praising God for it. I believe the spirit of healing in Jesus Christ is going to move over the land if the body of Christ prays and prays right. 
I declare it in the name of Jesus that even now those that are laying on their sick beds will be moved and touched by the spirit of healing from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So these people were on a high praise. Of course they would honor this man. They laid their garments at the foot of the animal that he was riding. <laughs> they were on a roll. And they were loud, so loud that some of the Pharisees, in verse 39, from among the multitude said to him, Master, rebuke your disciples. Make them shut up. Have you ever been in a grocery store or supermarket? The little child is loud. Whether he's crying, whether he's hanging on to stuff, whether he's just running through the store messing up stuff, and you have these people who don't have the understanding of the dynamic of a child. And so they look at the parent and they look at the parent as though the parent is doing something wrong or as though the parent uh, needs to, to grab this child and throw him against the wall or something. This is the kind of spirit of atmosphere that the Pharisees would have. They wouldn't have understood this praise. They wouldn't have had a clue as to what this praise was. Paul said it perfectly in the book of Corinthians. He said, for the natural man does not know the spirit of things, and, and, and neither can he understand them because they are spirit. So for them, it was just noise. It was just stuff that was getting in the way, and they were loud. So now, church, I don't want you to miss this. The Pharisees had mixed in with the worshipers. Listen to this. He, they had mixed in with the worshipers that were following Jesus. Anybody, anybody listening to me, you got any Pharisees mixed in with your experience, modern-day Pharisees. They don't see none of your right. They see all of your wrong and are willing and able on a drop of a dime to tell it to you in no uncertain terms. And you don't even know they're there until something happens that forces them to show themselves. It was too much for the Pharisees mixed in. Believe me when I tell you a person can only pretend to be something that they are not for so long, and then the real spirit comes forth. It's impossible to pretend to be something that you're not. That's why it's being exposed even now in our nation, in our government. The true Christians, those that really love God and have the love of God in them for people, that stuff is being exposed. You can't pretend to be something that you're not. The Holy Spirit will not allow someone to dismiss and dishonor him in such a fashion, a person who only has a passing relationship with Christ and not a personal one can't hold that thing in but so long, cannot be in the midst of true worshipers for too long before, oops, there it is. The Pharisees had to have yelled over the crowd. Keep in mind, this was loud. They had to have yelled over the crowd to even say what they said to Jesus. They even referred to him as master, not because they owned him as such, but because it's too much to hold in. It's a part of their camouflage. Master, they said, rebuke your disciples. You better shut them up, shut them down, make them stop. Church, if it wasn't so pathetic, you could almost laugh. The master is the head in charge. No one tells the master what to do. Can't you hear it even in some churches? Pastor, you need to. Pastor, why don't you? Jesus responded, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And of course, God, who made everything, could cause an inanimate object like a stone cry out as if it had flesh and blood running through its concrete. But may I tell you what I prayed so hard to get an understanding about this, and I believe that the Holy Spirit uh, responded to my prayer. In Isaiah 55, 11, God said, my word will not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. If these keep their peace, Jesus said, there will be an immediate response. It may not be seen with the naked eye. It may not be heard with the literal ear, but there will be a response. The rejection of me and my word will release action and activity in the spirit realm that cannot be denied that it is my response. If these whom I have blessed do not acknowledge me and honor me and praise me for who I am 
and the world may know that there is a God that sits high and looks low, there will, without a shadow of a doubt, in your face be a response. If these whom I have blessed and raised up from the muck and the mire, picked them up, turned them around, and planted their feet on the street called straight, bow before men because they're afraid to acknowledge me openly, even so much as to bow their head and bless the food that I place on their table in a restaurant setting. If these refuse to acknowledge me and own me as who I am, I give you my word, he says, there will be a response. Can't you hear it now, church? Listen to the sound of the stones crying. Listen to the sound. Listen, I can almost hear Jesus say, you couldn't fight as hard for me as your God, as Madeline O'Hara fought for her God, the devil, and now the stones are crying as your school halls run red with blood of your children because you allowed me to be arrested and evicted, and now you see what it's like for me not to be on your property. Listen to the sound of the stones crying as parents refuse to correct rebellious children, and now that same child is one doing the killing of others and maybe even of you yourself one day. You want to keep your peace on vital issues that matter to the health and welfare of people. You don't want to talk about abortion. You want to talk about the murder in the land. You want to talk about priest brutality. Keep your peace because I promise you there will be a response, and it may not be the response that you look for, hope for, or could even handle. But I tell you today, I'm not going to let no rock cry out for me. Can't no rock tell my story. Can't not rock tell what Jesus did for me. I'm not going to let no stone speak louder than I speak for the God of my salvation. But I hear the sound of the stones crying all over the land. I don't like that sound, I tell you. But I'm not going to let no stone tell my story. I'm not going to let no stone tell me that I'm beneath them just because I'm a black woman. I'm not going to let no stone tell me what I can and cannot do in the name of the Lord when the Lord has anointed me to do it. I won't let no stone shut my mouth when I speak to the issues of abuse and violence in the land and in the home. I will not let a stone silence me. No stone can cry out and say what I can say. A stone can't say, in Christ I live and breathe and have my being. A stone can't say, he brought me forth from a mighty long way. A stone can't tell the story of a struggle in a black neighborhood, in a poor neighborhood. A stone can't say that once I had a stuttering, stumbling tongue and was shy and hid back in the corners and nobody even knew I was there because I couldn't even talk. A stone can't tell that story. Oh, but I can through the power of God. And so can you. Don't let no stone cry out for you today. Don't listen to the sound of the stones crying. You can cry out for yourself. Praise his name. Glorify him. Honor him. Worship him and magnify him. Even though things seem to be so horrible in the nation right now, God is still on his throne. Make no mistake about it. Church, if you keep your mouth shut and not honor him and praise him, you don't have to cuss. You don't have to fuss. You don't have to take over control of the Capitol. You don't have to load a gun and walk down the street. You don't have to call people names. All you've got to do is say the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, devils flee. Jesus, Jesus, oh, how sweet the name Jesus every day proclaim. The Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, I love the name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus brings peace to my soul and power to my spirit. Jesus, no, 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 no. Can't no stone cry out for me. But if you keep quiet, he said it. The very stones will praise him. Why? Because they already know that if it was not for him, they wouldn't even be the inanimate object that they are. Don't let no stone cry out for you. But the sound of stones crying is all over the land as people are being disenfranchised and being dismissed and being rejected and being dishonored. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, forgive us for letting the stones speak to your glory when we wouldn't do it. Forgive us for letting the stones have a place in your experience that we refuse to take. Have mercy in the name of Jesus. But, oh, God, I declare unto you today, on behalf of every child of God that may not have done it, I apologize. We say, forgive us, Lord. We will glorify you. 
We will magnify you. We will honor you. And whoever's listening and watching, I don't care where you are, come magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Wherever you are, cry out the name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, how sweet the name Jesus every day proclaims. The mighty name of Jesus. What a mighty God we serve. Who would not serve a God like this? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And if you have been moved by this message, let me remind you, we are not permitted to hear the word of God and just go away saying, my, didn't we have a good time? The word of God is there to meet us at the point of our need, to challenge us in those situations in our life that we need to be challenged in. The word of God is there to remedy those issues in our lives. And so as you have received the word of God today, if you are one who has not accepted this precious Jesus as your savior, you don't know that if you died tonight, whether your soul would even fall into the hands of a righteous God. I invite you to come in the spirit, to come wherever you are and acknowledge this Jesus as your savior. Call on him. That's all you have to do. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I believe you are the son of God, the savior of the world. Jesus, I know I am a sinner and I need you in my life. Jesus, forgive me of all my sin. Come into my life and be my Lord. Save me now. I don't want no stone crying out in my place to be moved. And if you are that one that feels that way, you've accepted Christ for the first time, or you dedicated your life to Jesus just now, I want you to either write it in the comment section, but most of all, call us at 412-823-4049 and leave a message and say, I want more information. I want more prayer. I will personally call you my brother and my sister. 412 God bless you and may heaven smile upon you. And now those of you that are prepared for your communion elements, as the staff here in the sanctuary line up, socially distanced, to walk down, to be served, get your elements ready as well as we in obedience commemorate and celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. the night that Jesus was betrayed they were in the garden of Gethsemane and he was with his disciples for one last time he broke the bread and he passed it to them and he said take and eat for this is my body which is broken for you likewise he passed the cup and he said take and drink for this is my blood that is shed for you and as often as you do this remember me well what are we remembering we're remembering that we live because he died we remember that he did not only die and rise again, he's at the right hand of the Father even now, speaking on our behalf, and he is coming back. And so as we partake in these symbols of the broken body and the shed blood, we understand there's no power in them, but the power is in what they represent that we accept, and that is his suffering. Let us pray. Father God, we come now in the name of Jesus, and we're so thankful that you took our part over 200 years ago. You paid the debt we did not owe. We owed that debt, we couldn't pay it. And we're so thankful that even at this moment, we get the opportunity to let you know how much we loved you by obeying you. 
by showing forth your death, your burial, and your resurrection, by partaking of the symbols of your broken body and your shed blood. We know there's no power in them, but we accept the great grace that you have bestowed upon us through your suffering. So bless us even now individually and bless us corporately as we in obedience remember you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Take your and then just take your seat. Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together. As I bow on my knees with my face to the rising sun, oh Lord, have mercy on me. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church of Corinth that a man should examine himself to see if he be found worthy to partake of the symbols of the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord. At this time, wherever you are, in your home, in your car, in this sanctuary, let us all bow for a word of silent prayer. Amen. Let us eat together. And let us drink together. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of his Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with you all, henceforth, now, and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>